Did you study photography? No, I did art. I went to Howard Gardens and did a foundation course in art, and then I did a wacky course that was in um, King Coyd at the time. I think it's in the atrium now, but it was it was awarded by the philosophy department at Cardiff University, mm -hmm. but it was in the old South Morgan Institute, and it was art education, so it was art and philosophy, very handy. So, with the investment in setting, props, team mm -hmm. around you, it seems ideal to flick the switch and shoot some video. Ah, when DSLR video first kind of became a thing. Um, I sort of looked at it, and I, I was doing a, a couple of jobs, and I was I was photographing on location, <laughs> food, for Canon, Canon cameras, um, in London and then in Spain. I was working with a film crew, and I was doing the stills and the product photography in a food environment. So it was a product, but it was mm -hmm. there were there were chefs yeah. shooting it, um, and we did some of it in Jamie Oliver's place, and. Um, I was, I was watching them do it. I thought, do you know, I think I could do that, but I think I might be able to do that a little bit better than that because I'd have that light over there and that sort of thing. So we started doing it, and then we got asked to do a TV advert for a potato company, and we did it, and it was great. And then I made the mistake of, of thinking we could shoot video like uh, the people shot video. So I did quite a bit of investing in video tripods and bits and pieces, and... I did it for about a year. We did quite a few TV adverts in that period. A couple of really nice foodie mini docs as well. Um, it was all food based. Mm. And then I, I, I was sort of looking at it and I was thinking, you know, what we're doing here is wrong. We're kind of trying to achieve a result the same way that everybody else does it. And everybody else is being a TV production company or, you know, a mini film production company. So I got rid of all the video tripods and the sliders and the bits and pieces and went back to basics and a bit more Heath Robinson and all of a sudden it became a lot more fun and the results were much closer to what I wanted so now we um, we shoot mainly in 4k or high speed and we do a lot of stop frame as well and we're still doing TV adverts we've got a cinema advert we're looking at at the moment for Odeon cinemas which is really really cool but it's all about funky movements and making the food do what the food wants to do instead of trying to impose, mm. well, you know, we'll go and shoot a football match one day, we'll go and do a piece of camera the next day, we'll do a documentary, we'll do this. So we're doing, we've narrowed it right back down to where I wanted it to be mm. and we use very little um, video kit. We still light it properly. Um, I don't know if you noticed downstairs, I've got a set of uh, big old Ari tungstens. Yep. Um, and I do it all the old-fashioned way. Uh, start with really hard light and then soften it down as you need it. And we, we kind of only work in this size, but we've, we've pulled together some really nice bits and pieces. We built a, um, we've got a glass tank. We built a few in the end. Um, and we can pump oxygen or nitrogen through it, so it gives us that shot of... Um, potatoes or vegetables bubbling in a pan that sort of thing we, yep. we've got all sorts of things we did one job where we um, thank you chef can you slice that for me so have you got the pack to work from it's coloured up nicely chef but this is a really interesting I've got to say I'm really interested in how a chef like you would switch into this kind of role it's very special I mean have you uh, have you always had an appreciation for how photography was photographed and presented? Uh, absolutely, massively. What was your background um, then? My background is fine dining, I guess, from restaurants, country house hotels. Um, over the last sort of decade of my career, has been going more into sort of big hotel resorts. Um, certainly, the last seven years, I've run two hotel resorts, mm -hmm. um, and then I come to a point. I wanted to spend a bit more time with the family, so I looked into something else and got in, met up with Hugh, and you know, two years down the line, things are great. What's he like then? <laughs> Switch off the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't looking you directly in the eye then. I was, I was trying to get him when he was distracted. Yeah, great. You got a great uh, he report. He every word of it. Working report, and yeah. We got the understanding. Hugh's obviously highly skilled at what he does. Um, from my experience as well, it, to do something like this, you have to have a lot of experience to know how things will work, really. 
Mm. Um, you know, it's not just throwing something on a plate. We've had clients before, they've brought chefs along with them, you know, uh, sort of executive chefs that run, you know, units of their company, and they'll come down and literally have one or two plates lined up, ready to shoot, and it just doesn't work like that. Yeah, and it's not just art for art's sake. There's obviously the aesthetic in it, but this is commercial, isn't it? That you're on a budget, whilst at the same time delivering for the client and surpassing perhaps what they want or what they expect from you. Do you remember when the Olympics were in uh, the UK? The British cycling team did really well, didn't they? They said that their success was down to an accumulation of marginal gains. And that would be my advice to any aspiring photographer. How do you find good assistants? Do they come to you? Um, or are you on the hunt? OK, I'm, I'm not a massive fan of photography courses that are available at the moment. I, I think they um, I don't really equip students with um, the skills they need to work somewhere like this. Uh, and I've tried, to, you know, I've tried getting involved with the colleges and things, but um, I'm, not, I'm not an educator. I'm a, that's another skill. But we would rather somebody's passionate about food. Now, Matthew downstairs doing the research is a very keen home cook. <laughs> He's a very good cook, actually, Matthew. Manon's into cooking. And it's, the place is all about food. So, um, Are you a foodie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, very much. Um, but I think we, um, we can probably equip people with the photographic skills they require. But, you know, if people aren't interested in it, they need to go and work for a sports photographer or something like that. Now, Matthew downstairs is uh, an illustrator. He's got a degree in illustration, but he's, uh, he's, he really likes food and he's got an appreciation for what we want it to look like. So uh, we found him, Manon found us, you know. It's not a very big uh, community, is it, food, so it works. No, but without embarrassing her, what was it that attracted you to uh, Manon's portfolio or her work? What promise did you see there? For oh, her she her actually sent me a portfolio. You'd be amazed at how many students would send you a request for work experience and no photographs. I'm a keen photographer, blah, blah, blah. You know, I, I love food. Um, do you have um, internships available? Do you have this? And then there's no photographs. Oh, then, and then you Google them and they don't have any food pictures at all. Mm. From the first tick was to send us food pictures. Is it just me or is it, I mean, I don't know if there's a disproportionate amount of food photography on Instagram. It kind of falls into the category of food blogging for me, and yeah. I'm, I'm not a big fan of food bloggers. Um, I think some of them are okay, but, um, you know, we work in a professional food environment, and um, anybody can be a food blogger. They don't need to bring any specialist um, skills to it or experience. They might not know anything about food. It's mm. just their opinion. Well, if you read a newspaper, which I still do, and you read a restaurant review by A.A. Gill or something, they're bringing expertise to that. Yeah. You know, and apart from the fact it's really nicely written, mm. um, they know what they're talking about. What do you see as the big challenges going forward for... Are okay. there any in food photography, in the business side of what you do? In the business side, I think the, uh, the genuine challenge for every business moving forward is geography. Because, you, you know, our client base all comes from London. 95% mm. of it. And I think the, the challenge for everybody in the 21st century is to build a non-geographically specific business. Because we have the technology that will do it for us. Um, you know, FTP sites for delivery, emails, that sort of thing. You don't have to be close to your clients. Mm. And, you know, in our business, because most of our clients have got global distribution, mm. um, you know, the photographer can be on the M4 corridor you know, as long as you're not in the Outer Hebrides, mm. it works. Mm. So in terms of workflow and keeping the studio going from project to project, you'd rather be shooting and give it to the clients and let them... Well, all our, all our stuff goes out, retouched, um, for the colour corrected, etc., etc. Mm. Um, with video, we tend to give clients raw video. Right. Um, they're, you know, they're, that's a whole... A whole body of knowledge that, uh, not that we couldn't do it, but we just feel more confident letting them do it. Yeah. Go back to the setup. 
So I'm looking at you now, tweaking reflectors, mirrors on the tabletop with the uh, risotto, which is still looking... Still holding very well, Shall actually. We? Yeah, well done. Andre. How do your peers feel, Andre? Is this something they would aspire to, do you think? Do you um, think you're on a Kushti number? I guess so, I guess so. But like I say, not everybody could do it. Yeah. So it's, uh, you've got to be very patient and, and very skilled at the same time. And how do you challenge yourself? Well, just try to do the best job every, every dish we put out. Is just try to do the best job we can, really. Um, I mean, because you haven't got the 100 or 200 covers that you may have had previously, Absolutely, but where's the pressure in this? The pressure in this is a detail, because you cooking something, everything you cook has to be perfect. Mm. It's like a Michelin star restaurant. Mm. Every element has to be perfect. And then it has to come to the table and present it perfectly also. Mm. So, you know, cooking for 300 people, you know, there may be... One out of ten, the chicken's not in the right place, but it still goes out to the table. Mm. In this instance, it has to be perfect every time. I was saying to you earlier when we were speaking to him <laughs> that my, my perception, wrongly perhaps, but looking into these various roles in food photography, the chef and the stylist, are they one and the same or are they increasingly becoming the same person or are they very distinct roles? And, and, and They're skills? distinct roles, but then... A chef could quite easily become a stylist because they're creative in their mind anyway. Whereas a stylist, a creative stylist, may find it difficult to jump into the chef position because that in itself is very technical. Mm. And if they haven't got that background skill, then it's something they have to learn and it will take time to learn that. Yeah. Especially with the variety of things we do here. Yeah. How much time would you typically put into a, even just a project like this, sitting down, thinking, talking with the team, and is the clock ticking? Are you charging at that idea stage? Is that what people well, are we're, we're kind of constantly together, so we're constantly able to chat about jobs. Um, so yesterday, Andre and I would have had a chat about what we're shooting today, um, and last week we were chatting about a job we're shooting on Thursday, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know. Um, but do you think do you think there's still an appreciation for the time scale? team the creative input at the pre-shoot stage from clients or do you factor that into your costings anyway because many people would argue that the clock starts and they expect to be billed when the lights go on and the products arrived well uh, it does here it It does here um you know the thing with us is we're genuinely genuinely busy we're fully booked we turn clients away because we're fully booked Mm are in a situation where we've got eight days of work a week and we have to choose which five we're going to do. Yeah. Um, so we need to work. Mm. You know, we work on eight shots a day, um, average. If it's, if it's a lot of scratch, it might go down to four. Mm. Uh, if it's cake on a plate, it might go up a little bit. But um, it's, it's very production-led here. And where would it typically go wrong if you were going to have the odd problem crop up? Typically, where, where does that happen? The only time it goes horribly wrong is if a client wants a product to do something that the product doesn't do. We once had a job for Burger King and it was, um, it was a mozzarella stick. And um, Burger King wanted the mozzarella stick to, to, to stretch as it was torn. And it wouldn't do it. It just would not do it. Um, so the client had to remake the product for <laughs> photography. Um, and then it, 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 you know, it was one of those things. But, you know, a lot of people have got an idea that sometimes they have an idea and it just doesn't work. Mm. But that's OK. You know, we'll make it work as much as we can. And, you know, every now and again, we need to um, revisit what they're asking for. But generally speaking, we can make things work. Um, it's, it's very visual here. You can see, the, you know, the big screen. Clients, if they're here, they can see results almost immediately Mm. is there any product not necessarily a brand but a product a food product that you haven't done yet that you're gagging to do i don't particularly like whiskey Mm -hmm. we've got loads of whiskey clients i am quite fond of gin and we don't have as many gin clients as we have whiskey clients yeah i don't think there's any um sectors that we would products that we would we we feel we're missing um there's a few sectors we're, we're not working as much with. Uh, the coffee shop sort of sector, I think we could do more with. But, 
we're fully booked, so. So you enjoy books. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's obviously a lot of images in, in cookery books. But yeah. You, you're not that keen on the magazine and the editorial type no. projects. No. Um, it goes back to what we do, you know, and what we do is commercial food really well. Um, uh, magazine projects, we, we, you know, we do have photographs in magazines often. Um, but um, it's not our core business. Your brief isn't to fill that spread. Yeah, the client will give the images for use in it. Sort of. Magazines don't make any money at the moment, do they? Mm. A good friend of mine uh, was writing for The Guardian, and in a period of about five years, her fee was reduced by 90%. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the, the, it goes back to bloggers. You know, they're giving away content for nothing, aren't they? What's your view on the photography world in that respect? Oh. People just try, desperate. The number of graduates been pumped out, desperate to get the work in front of people. We exist in our little bubble here, um, and uh, it's very nice, and there's no windows. Occasionally we leave the building to go home and that sort of thing, but, you know, generally speaking, this is, um, this is a very delicate, man-made environment, and uh, I don't have to deal with other photographers and those kind of problems but I know um, a few of my friends who are doing um, editorial kind of PR type stuff for newspapers and magazines are oh, you know they're pulling their hair out because mm. magazines want more and more all the time for less and less mm. is that a confidence thing in the photographer though even the youngsters coming out the graduates talented graduates with good work you could argue some of them will find work because of the strength of the work. But there's just so many. No. Um, well, the Newport uh, Clean courses, which have just finished, haven't they? Um, or moving to Cardiff. Moving well. to Cardiff, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's three courses there. There must be an average of 30 on each course. That's 90 graduates a year. Now, we're a studio, so we do employ people. Hmm. Uh, who else employs photography graduates in, in South Wales? Yeah. Um, there may be two, two studios in Cardiff who would, mm. two, three. Mm. And the interesting thing um, about that, um, I was talking to Jonathan a couple of years ago from um, Pinegate, um, and Pinegate's still going, you know, he's still a great business, great photographer, and I was listening to Keith's interview on your website. Um, there's nobody new. Do you want to be scared? Do you want to see some of these new graduates come here and setting up on their own rather than seeking a job. Obviously, assisting is a, an when I, part. When it? I was a kid, the route to being a photographer was to be an assistant. And I learned all sorts of things about running a business, not just about taking photographs. And I, I wonder what students do now, because when they, they go to college, they learn about all sorts of photographers' work and that sort of thing. But does somebody explain VAT? All those soft skills, the business side. Well, they would argue they're being taught professional practice. I'm looking at Manon for affirmation here. Um, but that may be being taught more from an academic than a business person. So it's just spouting theory. But yeah, it's good to experience the bad things that go wrong in a project. The clients that you will never work with again. Yeah, um, I think, why. Um, you know, uh, photographers tend to work in isolation, yeah? Um, and uh, one of the um, downsides of working in isolation is that you set your own standards, don't you? And, you know, with DSLRs and looking at a picture on the background screen, it's very easy to be satisfied. Mm. Um, and pushing those standards constantly is, is difficult. And we do it. And after 30 years, we do it. You know, can we do this better? Mm. Can we produce a better result, you know? Mm. Can we buy a, big, a camera with a bigger chip? That sort of thing. Mm all the time but I'm not sure a lot of people in those college environments are teaching that. If someone gave you free reign to invent a food photography course would you grab that? Would, is there things you want to say? Things you want to teach? I'm, I went to uni I did art you know, and I think that you know there's a series of sensibilities there um, that when you're in the traditional art college environment you start to think about all manner of things mm. 
Yeah, not just photography. I think photography um, is one skill set, technically, you know, but you need a artistic sensibility. Going back to, you know, talking about Matthew downstairs, he does a great job. He has a degree in illustration. Mm. So I'm not sure that you, you would want to teach somebody from scratch food yeah. photography. You yeah. may want to, it could be a postgraduate course or something like that. Mm. But you'd want to see some serious technical skills first. Mm. I mean, never mind food photography. Do you think, as a discipline, photography could just be a one-year postgrad? Hmm. What's the best use of that academic Interesting question. I mean, one of the biggest problems with higher education now is the the quantity of teaching time is so limited, isn't it? Hmm. You know, students see their tutors for maximum, what, 18 hours a week? That didn't used to happen, did it? No. When I was in Howard Gardens, you'd see them for 50 hours a week. Hmm. Although, having said that, I think you probably agree, you would rely on the technicians a lot of the time for yeah, some of yeah. your training. And, you know, when I was in art college, technicians used to teach you to do things, mm-hmm. you know, um, how to prepare a canvas with rabbit skin glue and how to mix acrylic paints from scratch. And I mean, I, I learned how to weld when I was in art college with gas. Mm. A great life skill. Mm. Did you ever use it since? No. <laughs> I'd probably blow somebody up. I'm not a geek. I don't, I don't think I find pleasure in technology, but I do get a lot of satisfaction out of knowing something's as good as it can be. Is that a safety thing, or is it just client expectations? Um, we're not in central London, and generally when we come up against um, right. another photographer on a pitch, it's, it's somebody who's in central London. So whatever the best available is, we've got to have it. Yeah. It's straightforward, isn't it? As long as you always buy the best, mm. it's, uh, everything else falls into place. Do you ever shoot handheld? No. Do you go to on locations? We did a location job in January, I think. <laughs> I, I have shot handheld, yeah, now and again. But, you know, we tend to... One of, the, one of the advantages of doing a very small niche thing is that you can have the very best yeah. kit for that job. Mm. And if you do that job every day, five days a week, you might as well have the ultimate kit. Yeah. Um, the photographers who do a bit of this, a bit of that, you know, they've got to have studio lighting, location lighting, location cameras, loads of camera bags, all that sort of stuff. Well, we don't have that. Mm. We just have very, very expensive studio kit. Mm. And we've got a DSLR, you know, a little Canon thing. It's just a bit of fun. But where you may get a brief that um, bridges that, you know, the lifestyle and food, because uh, they both kind of marry up quite a lot now, don't they? Um, will you have clients that want that on the hoof type shooting or would you rather be tethered? Every now and again, you know, if it's a famous chef, you know, and it's a restaurant location, it's a bit of fun and it's somebody we don't know, yeah. Mm. You know, we used to do quite a lot with the Hand of Flowers, Tom Carriage. You know, so if you're in the kitchen, you're generally jammed into a corner yeah. with your elbows in. What I would do in that situation, I'd probably light the room and then use some kind of trigger slave. I still wouldn't use available lights. I'd light it all. And then move around. And then move around, yeah. yeah. The, the interesting thing about the backs, the, 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 the backs are great because um, when we bought this, the, the 80 million pixel leaf back, we, um, we've got the new Sinar uh, 100 by 100 DF camera, but also we've got the phase one medium format camera as well. So we can swap mm. between cameras but we're shooting on the same sensor, mm-hmm. and that's amazing. So we've got an autofocus camera body, so occasionally we've done jobs on that to make it look a bit more handheld. Right. So we're not pulling the focus in with the movements and things like that. We're just using a 120mm macro lens on that. It's lovely. Mm. Do you have a favourite lens for food photography? What's your one go-to as you're setting up? Or? Well, we've just changed lenses on this camera, actually. We've got the new 100mm, I think it's called a HR lens, the new Synard with the, the digital shutter. I mean, it's just amazingly sharp. And it means we can control everything from the keyboard. You saw Manon took the pictures. So everything, lights are controlled from on screen, the shutter's on screen. The only thing is I do the movements and the focus. As long as it's the sharpest lens on the market, it'll be, it'll be OK. Have it's you any horror right. stories of what you've had to bail a client out last minute because something's gone terribly, terribly wrong? I have no real horror stories, but one of the things I really like is when clients look at our bill and say, you know, it's a bit too much, we're going to go somewhere else, because you know they're going to come back. <laughs> and then they're going to pay a little bit more. 
just because they brought it up. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it, we, um, a lot of photographers um, will work for less money. I mean, the, the older guys, those of us who've been around a bit, you know, know what's the right charge, what's not the right charge. You know, mm. Some people overcharge, but um, there's always somebody who will undercut you. Always. Um, but... They do it because they do it quicker, and they do it quicker, there's less attention to detail. And, you know, that one day's photography, which you've just only, you know, just had done for 400 quid, mm. well, you've got to look at those pictures for 18 months, and then somebody, somebody's going to go, well, you know, that picture there that we had done two years ago with Jones, that's a mm. nice mistake. Mm. And then they come back. Mm. It's great. Uh, it's a confidence thing without being too cocky, isn't it? And, you know, as you say, there are people who are good at it. Mm. But they just haven't learned those soft skills of making the mistakes or the shortcuts that perhaps you could get in assisting. Um, but I think by inference from what you were saying earlier, do, do you see enough people approaching you for assisting jobs? I would get at least one email a week. Really? Yeah, at least one. So not just coming up to the end of the, uh, the year towards no, summer? No, no, no. There's always somebody who, um, who wants to work for nothing and you know it's great that there's people out there but you you do have to protect your brand a little bit you can't have everybody in the world walking around saying they've worked with you mm. but on that point how, how much time do you give people like man on and other assistants getting in to shoot will you let them loose on some of the produce leftovers obviously for their own portfolios now. You know, we, to, we tend not to have that much time available mm -hmm. for that sort of thing. What if they ask to come in or offer to come in early or a weekend? Yeah. It's always nice to, to hear people's ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and, f you know, because it's not editorial, we can't do whatever we want. There's a brand out there and we're being paid to be custodians of that brand. Yep. You know, so it, it's not a free-for-all. Mm. Um, so, you know, there, there are other avenues to investigate with every job, but um, we have to look after our client mm. at the end of the day. So it's not as if you can just throw everything up in the air. If you were doing, you know, slightly less brand-aware work, you probably could. Mm. 